Hey guys, it's Bella. Welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all having a wonderful day today. In today's video, we are going to be covering another Mystery Monday case, except this one is a solved case. And it was actually solved recently in 2019, so just a couple of years ago, after being unsolved for nearly 30 years. Before we do get into it, I just quickly want to thank today's sponsor, NordVPN, for making this video possible. I'm so grateful to be working with NordVPN and for their continued support of this series because they are genuinely the best. I remember years ago, I tried using a a different VPN and I tried to go into Netflix and Netflix they knew what was up and they would not let me in so I immediately cancelled that one tried not VPN and Netflix let me in they had no idea what was going on and so I have never looked back and it's funny because I used to use NordVPN in Australia to watch Love Island UK in real time because in Australia we always get it like three days late and I would get all sorts of spoilers so I used it for Love Island UK and now that I'm in the UK I actually use it to watch shows back in Australia like at the moment I'm using it to watch Mad Australia because it's really hard to find that in the UK I can't find it at all and this season of maths in Australia is juicy NordVPN as well is just so easy to use seriously one click and you're connected it keeps you safe online so you're protected from malware trackers ads you're protected when using public Wi-Fi networks and their dark web monitor also notifies you if your credentials have been leaked and it's also the fastest VPN out there so definitely go and check it out you can get a huge discount if you go to my link and you get the two-year plan and you will also get a bonus gift so definitely make sure you check it out I will leave the link in the description down below and all of the information and let's go ahead and get into today's case so Manny Stavik was born on the 16th of April in 1971 in Bellingham Washington to Mary and Glenn Stavik and then right after she was born they moved to a place called Palmer which is in Alaska but Glenn and Mary actually got divorced just three years later so in 1974 and right after the divorce Mary decided to move with three of her children so daughters Molly and Mandy and son Lee to a place called Acme which is in Washington and it's like this really small little town I think in 1974 it had a population of like less than 350 people so it's really tiny and they actually moved there because Mandy's best friend moved there and when they went to visit Mandy's best friend Mary just fell in love with it and so they decided to move as well Mandy actually did have an older brother as well his name was Bren and he stayed in Alaska with his father and he was actually tragically shot and killed the year after Mandy and Mary and Lee and Molly all moved to Acme the year after the divorce so in 1975 he was out on a hunting trip in Anchorage in Alaska and he was shot and killed he was shot multiple times in the head and the chest and there has never been any clues as to who was responsible for the shooting or any motive for anybody who would have wanted to do this so his case is still unsolved with no leads and honestly the Stark family has really seen their fair share of tragedy because Glenn's stepson so the son of his second wife actually drowned in a boating incident in the Kenai River in Alaska in 1988 when he was just 20 years old and of course today we're talking about Mandy's case which happened in 1989 so just the year after Spencer's death as well so I just can't even imagine losing one child, let alone three. Glenn Stavik lost three children, all of whom were under 21 years old. So Brent was 18, Spencer was 20, and Mandy was 18 at the time that this case took place. So let me tell you a little bit about Mandy Stavik. She went to Mount Baker High School and she was a very high achiever. According to one of her teachers, she, quote, wanted to do well in everything she did. She had it all going for her. She had a bright future ahead of her. She was involved in band. She played the flute, clarinet, and saxophone. She was fluent in sign language and she spoke Japanese. She was an honor student. She did really well in academics. And on top of all of that, she played a bunch of sports too. So she played basketball. She was a cheerleader. She played softball. She did horseback riding and she was also very passionate about running track. So, I mean, she really did it all. I really don't know how she had time for all of that. And she also just seemed like a really lovely person. She was described as bright and vivacious by friends and family. 
and they also said that she stood out. Her sister Molly said that she was larger than life and that she accomplished a lot in the short time that she was here. And even her like teachers were super fond of her. Her high school basketball coach, a man named Jim Freeman, had mentored her both on and off the court as well. And he almost acted like a father figure to her after Mandy's parents had divorced. And Mandy actually wrote a card to him which read, to Mr. Freeman, the one person who has inspired me and influenced me more than anyone. Thank you. You're the greatest. Sincerely, Mandy Stabick, class of 89, number 13. She was really just the type of person that everybody who met her loved. You know, she was kind, she was hardworking, teachers, friends, family, all just adored her. Her mother Mary said, I don't know what it is about her. I'm just an ordinary person. I don't know how I managed to have that child, which is just so sweet. Like the love that her mother had for her and so heartbreaking that she had to lose that. When Mandy was 18 years old, so in 1989 she graduated from high school and she was off to attend the Central Washington University with dreams to become a commercial airline pilot. And the same year, so 1989, she came back to visit Acme, came back from her university to Acme to visit for the Thanksgiving holiday. The day after Thanksgiving, so on the 25th of November, Mandy went out for a jog and she took the family's German Shepherd, who was named Kyra. And often she would go on these jogs with her mum and her mum would like ride a bike alongside her. But on this particular day, she just decided to take the family's dog. And she would run this same route every time she went for a run. So it was a five mile run from her family's house to the Nooksack River and back. And she would run this every single day. Like before she went to college, she ran it every single day. And then she was back home from the holidays. While she was in Acme, she would run this every single day. Same route. Mandy's brother Lee was actually at a friend's house on this particular day while Mandy was on her run and he saw her run by on her way back home but unfortunately she never made it home. After about two hours the family dog Kyra showed up at home alone and she was cowering, she had her tail tucked and like I said she was alone, Mandy wasn't with her and so Mandy's mother Mary immediately started freaking out, she was panicking because Mandy like she was very consistent in what she did so this was super out of character especially that the family dog had shown up by herself without Mandy. So Mary is immediately calling everybody she knows. The first person she calls is Mandy's boyfriend. His name is Rick and he hadn't seen or heard from Mandy. Mary's calling everyone else, friends, family, everyone she can think of. She calls the sheriff as well and she has basically everybody she knows out searching for Mandy. By this point, there's no reason she shouldn't have returned to home. So best case scenario, they were hoping that she had just injured herself and wasn't able to make it home, but nobody found any signs of Mandy. Soon enough, a massive manhunt was underway with police officers, volunteers, and bloodhounds all out searching for Mandy. After the first 24 hours passed and there were no signs of Mandy whatsoever, it was becoming pretty obvious that something bad had happened. There's no reason, like if she was injured or something, there's no reason that they wouldn't have found her by this point. And so while they continued their search, they also started to question those close to Mandy and those who knew her. Of course, they started with her boyfriend, Rick. They had dated on and off for three years in high school and they had actually come back from college together to visit for Thanksgiving, but he was cleared pretty quickly. He had an alibi and he was really like forthcoming and helpful with police. He wanted to do, you know, everything that he could do to help. During their investigation, they also found the last person who saw Mandy alive. It was a man in a pickup truck and he had seen her run past his truck on her way home. On the second day of the search, the search and rescue team started searching side roads and during this search, they actually found some green sweatpants and Mandy was wearing green sweatpants on her very last run. However, these were sent for analysis and they were never positively connected to Mandy. On the third day of the search, detectives, including lead detective Ron Peterson, took a boat out onto the Nooksack River to continue the search. And this is when they found Mandy's body floating in the Nooksack River and she was found wearing nothing but socks and her tennis shoes. The area of the river that Mandy was found in was pretty shallow and Mandy was a really strong swimmer so there was no way she would have drowned and there was like rocks and gravel at the bottom of this 
you know, shallow part of river. There was no signs of digging in these rocks. There was no signs of a struggle. And there was also found to be an, a head injury on, on Mandy's head. And so it was concluded that she was knocked out and that's what caused this injury on her head. And then while she was unconscious, she was placed in the river where she later drowned. Investigators had to remove Mandy's body from the river very carefully because they didn't want to disturb any evidence that may have been found on her body. And the lead detective on the case, Ron Peterson, was the one to do this and he did so successfully as he had recently gotten FBI training in working with DNA. And so when they did the autopsy, they were actually able to recover male DNA in Mandy and this male DNA came in the form of semen, which indicated that she had been sexually assaulted before she was murdered. Because of their findings up until this point, it was theorized that Mandy's assailant had abducted her from their vehicle because they believed she was too fast of a runner to be abducted on foot. They believe her assailant had a gun and that they pointed it at Mandy and told her to get into the car. They then kicked the family dog Kyra into a ditch before driving away with Mandy. They believe he then took her about three and a half miles away to where this like field of blackberries were and that's where he sexually assaulted her. And this is believed because Mandy actually had all of these scratches all over her arms and legs. And so they theorized that she got these scratches from actually trying to escape and running through these blackberry fields because the blackberry trees had all of these thorns all over them which would have scratched her up as she tried to get away. But unfortunately her assailant actually managed to catch up to her and grab her. They then knocked her out and placed her body in the Nooksack River, which is where she drowned. While the investigation got underway as to who could be responsible for this, a memorial service for Mandy was held and her high school basketball coach, Jim Freeman, was the one who gave the eulogy and nearly 1,000 people attended this memorial. Like this was a really huge deal for everybody in this town. It was a really emotional time because this town Town, up until this point it was considered a really safe place where people kept their windows unlocked people kept their doors unlocked I mean as we know from these cases, no place that feels safe is ever truly safe. But in Acme, they had this really strong sense of community and innocence. And it was really shocking as well for a lot of people in this town because they just, you know, it was scary and it, they just didn't expect something like this to happen in their town. And they didn't know if this person who was responsible, they didn't know who it was. So they didn't know if they were gonna strike again. Once news about the murder got out and got around town, tips poured in. In and detectives followed up every single one. There were a lot of tips about this one guy in particular. His name was David and he was a local drifter and you know, people called in about him, thought that he was like a little bit suspicious. He might've had something to do with it. So detectives went and interviewed him and they actually got a warrant to get his DNA, but his DNA was not a match. And so he was cleared. Detectives got DNA samples in the form of saliva swabs from 30 different men in the area, but none of these saliva samples, DNA samples were a match to the DNA found on Mandy. And with no other evidence, no other leads, Mandy's case went cold. It wasn't until 25 years later that there was actually another lead. Detective Kevin Bowie had gone to the same high school as Mandy and he had never given up on her case in the last 25 years. And so in 2009, he actually got promoted to lead detective. And so he was like pouring over the case files, over every single little piece of evidence that they had. And as he was looking, he noticed this name pop up, the name John Wisniewski, and he was a local drug dealer in the area at the time of Mandy's murder and he had actually gone around telling people that he knew who was responsible for the murder. So in 2010, Detective Bowie actually flew to Cambodia because that's where John had moved to and he went there to just go and question him and try and figure out more about, you know, why he was telling people he knew who murdered Mandy. But when he went to question John, he was not very forthcoming whatsoever. He just kept saying, I don't know, I don't know, which 
Bowie like could just tell that this guy was lying but there was nothing he could do about it. He had no evidence. He couldn't make this guy talk you know because he had nothing so it was just a hope for the best and it didn't work out sort of thing and so the case went cold again for another three years. And then in June 2013 detectives got a new lead and this lead actually came from just like these two random mums having a conversation at a water park. Their names were Heather Backstrom and Merrily Anderson. They had both gone to Mount Baker High School as well, the same high school that Mandy went to. And so in June 2013, they both decided to take their kids to the Birch Bay water slides. May I like note here that they didn't know each other. Like they barely knew each other in high school. This day, you know, they just so happened to take their kids out to the same place on the same day. And they were sitting with a bunch of other mums in this like grassed area, just like waiting while they're kids played on the water slides. So while they're all waiting for their kids, you know, all of the mums are sitting there and one of the mums just kind of says, like, she brings up Mandy Stavick and I can't believe we don't know who did this sort of way. And, you know, everyone who went to Mount Baker High School, everybody who lives in Acme or lived in Acme knows who Mandy is because her case had such a massive impact on the town and it really just changed the whole feel of the town. You know, it went from this, like, place that feel, felt really safe and innocent to this place that was kind of scary you know there was a killer living amongst them nobody knew who it was so it just kind of really changed the whole feel of the town so like I said all of these mums were talking one brings up Mandy Stavick I can't believe we still don't know who did it and that's when Heather says I know who killed her and everyone was kind of taken aback and you know then Merrily says I do too and like I said these women do not know each other like they barely knew each other by this point they were just in the same place at the same time when this conversation was happening and they both had a feeling they knew who it was and they both had separate experiences with this man that they thought was the killer but neither of these women had ever gone to the police with their suspicions because you know they said it was a small town so they didn't want to accuse anyone without any proof because it would just be like a big deal that they didn't want to deal with and I think because they both had like creepy experiences with this guy they were probably a little bit scared too I mean it is a shame that neither of these women even tried to call up even anonymously just to give this guy's name and say hey I think maybe you should look into him but you know what's done is done so the man that they believe responsible was a man named Tim Bass and he had also gone to Mount Baker High School and he was actually a friend of Marilee's husband which I mean it's probably another reason that she didn't want to come forward about him but she starts telling Heather about her experience with Tim Bass and this happened just a couple of years after Mandy's murder so she's at home alone it's just her and her infant child her husband is not there at the time he's like off on a work trip or something and Tim just shows up at her door one night she can hear the other side of the phone she can hear it's just going like beep 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 so he's dialed a number that's not even connected sort of thing and she started to get really scared at that point because she believed that he had come in dialed a number he knew wasn't even a correct number just as an excuse to get into her house after that he then walks through her kitchen into her bedroom and he's like calling out to her and saying you know I used to drive by your house and I've always been in love with you and I want to make love with you which you know merrily was terrified by this point her husband's away he's not coming home at any point during this interaction to say get out of my house or what's going on or save her from this interaction she's telling Tim no but Tim is trying to convince her to come to the bedroom trying to sleep with him and he was refusing to leave until eventually she threatened to call the police and he left which must have been the biggest relief when he left far out so after Merrily is done sharing her like creepy experience with Tim. Heather then shares her own experience and this happened just a few months before Mandy's murder when Heather was 15 years old and Tim was 21 years old at the time. She and Tim had both gone to a softball game together with another guy named Dan and Dan was actually like he was a friend of Heather's at the time but they later on like went on to get married. After the softball game Dan drove the three of them to the Dairy Queen in this truck and it was one of those trucks that like the front seat is like three seats so it was Dan in the driver's seat she was in the middle and then Tim was on the other side of her and she was wearing like cut off denim short shorts and Tim just starts like aggressively flirting with her he's telling her how beautiful her eyes are he then gets a pen and starts kind of like you know 
rubbing it along her bare legs and mind you he's 21 she's 15 she felt so uncomfortable but she was also trying not to make a big deal trying not to make a scene because she was like you know Dan's here he's not gonna do anything in front of Dan he's not gonna take this any further in front of Dan and I mean she was right but she felt so uncomfortable nonetheless but because of this experience when Mandy was murdered a couple of months later she immediately thought back to this experience with Tim Bass and just had a feeling that he could be responsible. So after Heather and Merrily shared their experience, their shared experience with this guy and the fact that they thought he might be responsible for Mandy's murder, Merrily went home that night and she called another friend who also went to Mount Baker High School. It seems like everybody in this area went to the same high school, but she calls him and he now worked for the Whatcom Sheriff's office and she told him her suspicions about Tim Bass and how this other woman had suspicions about Tim Bass and this is actually what led to an investigation into Tim Bass. Up until this point Tim had actually never been questioned in relation to Mandy's murder like him, he had a brother named Tom, he had a father, like no one in his family had been questioned in relation to Mandy's murder which is crazy to me because he actually lived on the same street as Mandy in Acme. Me. And so every time Mandy would go jogging, she would actually run by Tim's house, but nobody thought to question him because, you know, he came from a family that was well liked and well respected in the community and, you know, it just couldn't have been him sort of thing. And so he's never been questioned. His brother has never been questioned. His father has never been questioned. None of them have ever been questioned in relation to this matter. I know I repeated that a bunch of times, but I just find it so crazy because they lived on the same street. She jogged past his house. He went to the same school as her. I just feel like they would have almost questioned everybody at this point. What makes this situation even crazier to me is that Tim's brother, his name was Tom, which I also cannot get over, Tim and Tom. Like it reminds me of like, Bill and Ben, the flower pot men. <laughs> anyway, Tom, apparently, like allegedly, he knew Mandy and I read that they may have even been friends. So that just makes it even more insane to me that like in the DNA sweep, they didn't get any of their DNA, didn't question them, nothing. And so for the past, you know, 20 plus years that Mandy's murder has been unsolved, Tim has just been a free man and he's just been living a quiet, simple life apparently. Six weeks after Mandy's murder in January of 1990 when Tim was 22 he actually got married to a woman named Gina and she also went to Mount Baker High School. It almost seems ancestral this high school but they got married and then they moved to Everson which is about 19 miles or 30 kilometers from Acme. Tim got a job there as a local delivery driver for the Franz Bakery outlet and he and Gina had three children together. According to Gina though their relationship was a nightmare for her. She was the first person that police questioned after Tim's name was brought up and they started looking into him. They questioned her before they questioned Tim or anybody else. She told them that she had basically married Tim to get away from home but marrying him basically felt like she went to prison. She said that he was very controlling and emotionally abusive and he told her what she could wear, what she could do, who she could see or speak to. He would also just treat her like his servant telling her like go get me a drink, go get me food. When detectives later went to question Tim's brother Tom, he also said that he had seen and heard his brother tell Gina to shut up more times than he could count. And for Gina, she just felt scared. You know, she had been with this man for nearly 30 years and not because she wanted to be, but because she was scared. Like she actually did try to leave him at one point. She left for two months and she got a restraining order against him. But when she tried to start divorce proceedings, he told her that he would lie to the courts and he would not let her see their children ever again. And so she got back with him. She did what she had to do or what she thought she had to do to keep her children. You know, she would do anything for her children. Gina also told police that Tim would actually watch crime shows and documentaries about Mandy's murder and he would comment on it. He would talk about how stupid the murderer was, how he didn't cover his tracks, and he wouldn't be surprised if the murderer got caught, which is just so incredibly eerie to think that 
he was watching, you know, TV shows and programs and documentaries about a murder that he committed and commenting on it as if he had nothing to do with it. So creepy. Like I said, investigators also spoke to Tim's brother, Tom, and he said that Tim had always been a loner and that social interaction had just never been a natural thing for him. He recalled one time in high school, Tim was at home in his room and his girlfriend broke up with him over the phone and he had a pistol and basically said to her, I'm gonna kill myself. And then he actually fired the gun into the air. From that moment on, something just kind of snapped in Tim, according to Tom. He just really started to show this disgust and disrespect and disregard for women. Even Tom's wife, Robin, noticed it. She said that it was clear that Tim believed that women were inferior to him. And like, even at work, he worked at the Franz Bakery outlet. Like I said, his boss there was a woman named Kim Wagner. And apparently he would never call her by her name. He would never call her Kim. He always referred to her as woman, which is just about the biggest red flag ever. Like imagine that. So after gathering all of this evidence against him, you know, they're really thinking they're on the right track here. They might have their guy and they go and question Tim at his house. And when they ask him about Mandy, his initial reaction is to pretend he doesn't even remember her. You know, he looks up, he goes, hmm, Mandy, 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 you know, and he went to Mount Baker High School. Like there is no one who went to Mount Baker High School around the same time as Mandy that does not know who she was and she ran by his house every single day there's just no way he didn't know who she was her murder was just about the biggest thing in this town nobody would forget her name there's no way he forgot her name eventually he's like oh yeah like isn't she the girl that was found in the river and like the police are just not having it one bit if anything it just made them more certain that they were on the right track with this guy because it was so clear that he was lying and for what for what reason would he be lying about this unless you know, of course he was guilty or had something to do with it. So police ask him if they can, you know, get a sample of his DNA and he says no. He says, well, you know, I watch all of those crime shows and I see how people go to prison for their DNA and it's like, well, yeah, dude, because their DNA matches because they're guilty. But police don't want to push it because they don't want to scare him off. So they decide to try and get his DNA another way and they take a different approach. They decide to put surveillance on him for the next day and kind of follow him on his bakery delivery route. Out, hoping that he's like gonna throw a can away or a cup or something like that that they can get his DNA off but he didn't he didn't throw anything away so the next step is they go to his work at the Franz Bakery outlet and they talk to his boss a woman named Kim Wagner and they tell her they're investigating an employee of the bakery and they ask her a little bit about him and she said you know he's just a weird dude he like you never knew what he was gonna be like at work and the smallest things would make him angry they ask her if she could give them Tim's delivery route, maybe like there's a cigarette butt he may have smoked or a cup or something lying around. She says, look, this is way above my pay grade. Like you're gonna have to go to HR. And so they go and they talk to the bakery's corporate and the corporate, again, they don't wanna borrow of it for legal reasons. They're like, we need some sort of subpoena or warrant or something like come back to us when you've got that and we'll help you out. But the issue was they don't have a subpoena or a warrant because they don't have enough evidence at this point. So police eventually get in contact again with Kim directly. And in their first meeting, they didn't bring up Mandy. They basically said like, we're just kind of investigating one of your employees, Tim. They didn't bring up Mandy. They didn't say what they were investigating him for. And between their first meeting and their second meeting, Kim had gone out with her husband and a couple of friends. And I guess she brought up the fact that police were asking about Tim. And one of her friends was like, oh, like Tim Bass, isn't that the guy who lived on the same street as Mandy? Andy before Mandy was murdered. And that was kind of just like a light bulb moment for Kim. She was like, oh my God, that's why they're asking about him. Like it's obviously in relation to Mandy's murder. And it all just kind of made sense for her. And she just had like this gut feeling that it was Tim, that Tim was responsible for Mandy's murder. It all just clicked. And I mean, it especially made sense for her because she had experienced Tim's disregard for women firsthand with him, you know, never calling her by her first name, only, only referring to her as 
as woman and his very short temper, like he got mad about the smallest things. And so when detectives came in to talk to her a second time, ask her more questions about Tim, she was on it. She was gonna do whatever she could do to get his DNA for them. And she actually offered straight out, she's like, do you want me to get his DNA? Like, do you want me to get a cup or find something he's discarded and give it to you guys? And they're actually not allowed to ask civilians to do that. So they said no, but if you do bring in any evidence to us, like we can take a look at that. And so she was going to do everything she could from that point on to get Tim's DNA in whatever way that she could. From that point on, she kept her eye on Tim. She would like change the garbage bags all the time so that if he did throw out like a coffee cup, a plastic cup, a can, whatever into the bin, then it would be unlikely to be contaminated by anything else in that bin. And it took three long months for her to get DNA from him because like, you know, obviously he watches like crime shows and that sort of thing. So he knows how detectives can get DNA off like cups and that sort of thing. So he wore gloves so that his fingerprints wouldn't get on anything. And he took all of his rubbish home for three months. Like plastic cups he would drink out of, cans he would drink out of. He would take it all home. So there was no possibility of someone getting his DNA. I mean, how guilty does that look? To take your rubbish home for three months is just crazy to me. During this three months that they didn't have his DNA and Gina was trying to get his DNA, the police decided to cast kind of a wider net of suspects. They just wanted to make sure they weren't getting tunnel vision on Tim. They wanted to rule out all other possibilities, all other possible suspects, just kind of make sure that they were doing their due diligence. And so they did a DNA sweep. They got the DNA of three dozen men and tested their DNA. And of course they asked Tim to be a part of this DNA sweep, but he obviously refused. And none of these three dozen men were a match to the DNA found on Mandy. Finally, after three months, Tim slipped up and he put, like he had drunk from the little drinking fountain, they, their little plastic cups, and he had put it in the bin. And then later that day, he also put a Coke can in the bin and Kim saw this happen. There was people in the bakery and her heart was racing. So she had to wait for him to like leave the area, go into the bin. She grabbed those out and put them straight into her desk so that she could later give them to the police. And the police then sent them off to be analyzed for DNA. And it took three months for them to get those DNA results back. But after three months, they came back and it was a match. The detective on this case, Kevin Bowie, he had been on the case for 30 years almost. And it was just such a crazy moment for him that it was like almost finally solved. You know, they had their guy, he had never given up on Mandy. So this was a really huge deal for him. And he actually cried when he got the news, you know, the results. After getting the results, Detective Bowie and another detective went back to Tim's work to question him again. And they asked him, you know, have you ever been in a relationship with Mandy? He said, no. They said, did you know Mandy at all? He said, no. They said, so you've never shared a kiss or anything like that? He said, no. And they said, so how was your DNA found on Mandy? And he immediately went from like denial to how did you get my DNA? Like laser focused on the fact that they had gotten his DNA. He's like, how did you get my DNA? What are you talking about? After that, on the 12th of December in 2017, just over 28 years after Mandy's murder, Timothy Forrest Bass, who was 50 years old at the time, was arrested in the bakery parking lot and was charged with kidnapping, rape, and murder. Later that same day, the sheriff went to Mandy's mother Mary's house to inform her of the news. It was actually her birthday that day. It was her 81st birthday and she was just elated. You know, she said it felt like a birthday present. She had never in a million years dreamed that this day would come after 28 years. After Tim's arrest, they took him to the station for questioning and they were asking him, you know, why he did it, how he did it. And by this point, they already had their, you know, theories. They believed that he saw Mandy running past his house because if he was just like sitting in his house in his living room he could just see her through the window run past his house and they believe he saw that and he like fixated on her from that point on but he would not admit to anything he was saying you know are you trying to get me to admit to something I didn't do and he just professed his innocence the entire time and then he had the audacity to claim that he had a secret affair with Mandy that they were actually lovers he said it started off as a friendship and then they 
began talking more and more and eventually it turned into like a physical thing and that when she came back to visit from college on the Thanksgiving holidays that they actually slept together consensually before her murder. He said quote, I met her I think I was with my dad. We were mountain bike riding up and down the road and he talked to her. He had a way with people. He just talked to her and I talked to her and then after that I'd mountain bike up and down the road and she'd jog and then we'd talk and stuff. I think that was in the spring. It wasn't that long a relationship because she went away to college. I want to say Eastern or Central. Literally no one had ever seen them together. No one corroborated that they had ever spoken. There was no evidence of any phone calls between them. No one could put these two as having known each other at any point in any capacity. There was literally zero evidence that they had ever interacted. And his excuse for that was that like they didn't phone call, like you know, when she came back for Thanksgiving, for example, she just showed up at his house and was like, hey, like let's sleep together basically. Like there was no need for calls or communication or like evidence that they spoke or anything like that because it was just, she would show up and it would happen sort of thing. And may I remind you that when police first questioned him, he pretended he didn't even remember Mandy, like didn't even remember her name. You know, he's like Mandy, Mandy, Mandy. And now he's claiming that they were actually like secret lovers. Obviously nobody believed his story and Mandy's sister said specifically, there's no way my sister would have had a relationship, a physical relationship with Tim Bass. She was way, 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 way out of his league to put it bluntly. And amen, sister, she was way, 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 way out of his league. There was just no way. So Tim Bass's trial began in May of 2019 and he pled not guilty, of course. And his defense attorney was Stephen Jackson. And he tried to convince the jury of Tim's story that they had a consensual relationship and they had consensual sex hours before Mandy's murder. He then gets like an expert witness, Dr. Elizabeth Johnson, to take the stand who basically testifies that the semen could have been deposited up to two days before the murder, which I also feel like is a weird sort of witness thing to say, considering he's arguing it happened just hours before she murdered, and then they're getting an expert to say, but it could have been deposited up to two days beforehand. Like, what is it? Did it happen two days beforehand, or did it happen two hours beforehand? Like, what is your story? It seems like you don't even know. Like, which is it? Does the two days even matter if you're trying to argue it happened like a couple of hours beforehand. It's almost contradictory. He also claimed that there was no sign of a struggle, even though like there were scratches all up her arms and her legs. And then he also said that sexual conduct is not evidence of rape or murder. And I know everybody needs like a defense attorney. Everyone has a right to a defense attorney, whatever. But this defense attorney in particular seemed like a douche. Like when asked in an interview if there was any proof or any evidence, if he had any proof whatsoever that Tim and Mandy had had a consensual relationship, he said in like the most annoying douchey tone, like, first of all, I don't have to prove anything. The burden of proof is on the prosecution, which like, yeah, that may be true, but like, he just said it in such a douchey way. Like it gave vibes of like, he just cares about winning a case. You know, he doesn't care if he's getting a murderer off. He just wants to win the case. That's the vibe, you know, just the vibe that I got. Now the prosecuting attorney was Dave McKeetron and he was 44 when Mandy was murdered. And at the time of the trial, he was 73 and he actually came out of retirement just for this case and insisted on not being paid to prosecute this case. The prosecution had their own expert witness take the stand, Dr. Gary Goldfogel, and he was actually the original medical examiner on this case nearly 30 years ago. And he disagreed with the defense's expert witness that the semen could have been deposited up to two days prior to the murder. He said various indicators show that it was much sooner. And he also said that his findings were consistent with Mandy having been raped, murdered, and then dumped and drowned in the river. Tim's brother Tom also took the stand and said that Tim was really nervous after he was questioned by detectives and they asked him for a DNA sample. And apparently he told Tom at that time that he had slept with Mandy, that they had slept together a couple of times before she went away to college. And then when she came back to visit from college on Thanksgiving weekend, they also slept together. And then he said, like, this is just what Tim is claiming. Like he's never mentioned this prior 
prior to detectives questioning him and now all of a sudden he's saying to Tom like we slept together a bunch of times including right before her murder and oh also I was hoping that you would say you slept with Mandy as well I guess to like you know paint this picture that she got around and Tom refused to lie for Tim. Tim's wife Gina also took the stand at the trial and originally when she was first questioned she actually gave Tim an alibi because you know I guess he told her to and she was really scared so she felt like she had to do it to protect herself and she had said that on the day of the murder she was with Tim she saw Mandy jog past but she was there with Tim the whole time but you know she took the stand and she said that wasn't true she wasn't actually with him that day she had lied for him. I guess, you know, once they got his DNA and Tim was arrested, she finally felt safe and secure enough to tell the truth. She said, quote, what do you say to someone like that? Like, you have to be very careful what you say. I felt like I just had to agree with everything he's saying because if I don't, I could be next. I wasn't a strong person back then. I was very weak, but I should have gone with my gut instinct. She also testified, interestingly enough, that Tim had asked his mother to lie for him and to point the finger at his dad who had died over a decade ago. One of Tim's defense attorneys said, you know, she tried to explain all of this by saying like, you know, sometimes when innocent people are under a great deal of suspicion, they will do things that, you know, makes it seem like they're guilty, which I think is just like a massive stretch in this case. Tim's mother, Sandra Bass, also took the stand and she denied that Tim had ever asked her to lie for him. She also said that Tim got good grades in high school. He never got into any trouble. Trouble. He worked hard at his job and in college and that she believed he was already found guilty in people's minds before the trial even started. And she also said that she believed that there was no actual evidence against him and she believed that the prosecution just wanted this case solved even if they had to convict an innocent person. Multiple people from Tim's family and people that he knew took the stand of this trial and not one single person could corroborate the fact that him and Mandy ever knew each other. There was no evidence that they had ever even communicated. There was no phone calls, nothing. There was literally zero evidence that they had ever even spoken. Tim's trial lasted three weeks and the jury deliberated for just over a day and then 29 years and six months to the day since Mandy was murdered, Timothy Forrest Bass, who was 51 at the time, was found guilty of murder, rape and kidnapping. He had a sentencing hearing six weeks later on the 2nd of July in 2019 and Mandy's mother Mary and her sister Molly were too emotional to speak and so Molly's husband spoke for them and he said Timothy Bass must never be allowed to walk the earth as a free person never ever. Tim also spoke at the hearing and he said, and I quote, I would first like to say that I am 100% innocent of this crime. Furthermore, I don't believe I received a fair trial. In saying that though, the better man in me says I should say very little today and give this day to the Stavik family. The judge then sentenced him to the maximum sentence, which is 320 months. And I think that's like just under 27 years. They couldn't sentence him to life in prison because the prosecution didn't charge him with premeditated murder because they weren't sure that they could secure a conviction for that and they thought it was more important to get him behind bars for however long they actually could get him behind bars for than risk charging him with premeditated murder and risking a hung jury or a mistrial or having him found not guilty. Tim Bass is currently incarcerated at the Clallam Bay Correction Center and he is under close custody which means he has more supervision, he has less freedom of movement and limits on personal property and programs he can attend and he is scheduled to be released in January of 2036. His wife Gina said she lived in 28 years of prison with him and now it's his turn. Mandy's mother Mary also said that she felt like she got closure when Tim was sentenced and found guilty. She said that although nothing will bring her daughter back there is some comfort in knowing the man responsible for her murder has finally been brought to justice. During the initial investigation into Mandy's murder, a reward fund was set up which raised about $25,000 and this money was raised in the hopes of generating leads that might lead to an arrest in Mandy's case. However, this reward money was actually donated to a scholarship fund at the Mount Baker High School. It's been awarded 29 times since 1990 and it's awarded to students who take an active part in the Mount Baker High School music program. More information about that scholarship can also be found on the Mount Baker High School website. So I'll 
you know link that below to check out but that's everything for this case that's it from me today guys as always i would love to discuss your thoughts about this one in the comments down below because i mean it's crazy that a case can take so long to be solved almost 30 years it took for this case to be solved and not just that but like they kind of knew that it was this guy for years before he was finally arrested and it's sad that he got to live a free life for so long knowing that he murdered mandy and kind of like getting off on it like watching crime shows and documentaries about it and also like almost holding his wife hostage like it just sounds like she had an absolute torturous time being with this man for that whole time as well but that's everything so i'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below and hopefully i will see you guys in my next video bye guys